Welcome to Transvision 2024. Um, <laughs> um, so I will uh, say a few short introductory words as we are uh, more or less on the 25th anniversary edition of the conference. I'll do a little retrospective. But first, I'd like to uh, tell you a little story. Um, in January of 1916, there was a major flood that happened in the side of Zee, in an area of the Netherlands that's, that's quite close to us. Uh, there was a major storm that forced the water inland, uh, southward, into the sea, and causing very high water levels, which in turn caused several dikes to fill, and the flooded areas are, are shown here on the map, and uh, several people lost their lives there. And it was decided after that disaster to build the Afsluitdijk, literally the closing dike between these two parts of the country, between these two coastlines here, uh, turning the sea into a lake and to reclaim or impole them uh, several new land masses, which are also indicated there on the map. And so, um, as the story goes, slowly the dike from each coast moved inward towards the center. Uh, as the hole got narrower, the force of the in and out flowing tide was increasing. Pontons, ships and cranes crowded during the last days around the opening. The tension rose, roaring and foaming from the mud, the ebb and flow tide threw itself on the ever closing gap. The machines came closer, filled the last opening in the dike, and the dike held. Today, the Afslide Dijk is just a normal highway. Driving over it with the rough ocean on one side, then you are overcome by a momentary feeling of optimism about the humankind. These are not my words, I'm quoting from an essay uh, that Frank Westermann wrote for the Goede Amsterdammer. Um, so now the sea had become a lake and the incoming water from the connecting rivers soon turned the salt water into fresh water. Now, this affected uh, one type of creature in particular. Uh, the anguilla anguilla, commonly known as the eel, is a type of fish that's known for its elongated snake-like body. Uh, the eel is a very special creature in that it lives and migrates between fresh and salt water environments. Um, eels were abundant in the sea, and they remained there as the sea turned into a lake. And they were doing pretty well. They were, they were thriving there. Now, the thing is that the eel is also a quite tasty and nutritious fish, and was being specifically fished for, for uh, hundreds of years by the people living around the sea. Um, because the, the eels are pretty fine, both in, in fresh and salty water, uh, they were doing quite all right despite this rather radical change in their uh, living environment. However, suddenly in the summer of 1971, the eels suddenly vanish. The fisher people go out and they come up with a completely empty catch. In a mysterious way, um, they, they don't understand what's happening. It was in, in a span of weeks that the catch went from normal to virtually zero. And of course, people were looking at the offslide deck. It might have something to do with it. And, yes indeed, there was a national service for fishing research in the Netherlands, and it concluded that eels are escaping into the North Sea. They're swimming away. The solution is a trial to make the locks unpassable for fish. Screens are placed in the locks, and even an electrical system was devised to send pulses of current into the water to deter the fish from swimming out. But, as you could probably see it coming, none of this seemed to be working. For the next 30 odd years, the population of eels in the Eisel may have continued to decline, and now it's at about 1% of what it once was at its peak. So, um, of course, it was the eel migration that was being blocked off by the Afslat Dijk. So it took 30, 30 odd years since the plummet of the fishing catch for people to finally realize that and spring into action. Um, so before the dike was built, I mean the eels are performing this incredible voyage, right? They're uh, swimming halfway across the world, going to this area here off the coast of North America, 
to, uh, to spawn, to mate, to spawn. And uh, that's where the young eels are then born. And they will migrate all the way back to the Zuidersee or the Eiselmeer, except of course now they couldn't because it was blocked by the dike. So um, now we kind of come up with this moral question, who has precedence? So to put it bluntly, and quoting from the article, a grinning Jeremy Clarkson driving his Mercedes-Benz SLR for the UC program Top Gear over the Aufschlag dike, or the eel quietly swimming at the foot of the dike. So now I'm, I'm putting it in this kind of, kind of trade-off. Uh, who has the precedence, the, the humans, or the ecology, the environment? However, there might be a solution for both. For its 90th birthday, the Afslite Dijk got extended with a so-called fish passage. An underwater passage right through the dike. And this is like a tunnel for the eels to pass through the dike. Um, the dike still has its function to block the, the water. Uh, but now there was a special passageway that's specifically designed for the eels and the fish. Eels are uh, lured into this passage by spraying salty water and spraying fresh water on each side of the passage. And um, it's a success. The fish passage, the passage, it works. It's, um, as you can, you can see from the, the, the gentleman demonstrating it here, the eels are coming, the eels are migrating, the, the mature eels go out of the lake to the breeding ground. Uh, the young eels find their way back. However, it's, it's just one small passage for 32 kilometers of dike, so the impact is still small, but the principle works. And so why am I telling you all of this? Um, if you think of um, the eels as actors in a network of interactions, um, this kind of view was espoused by um, uh, Bruno Latour and colleagues, uh, known as actor network theory. It's this network interaction view of the world. And it has a few basic tenets, which can be summarized by these, these four points. Interactions shape outcomes. So the way actors interact with the network determines the outcome. For example, how a community uses new technology, like the internet, can shape the technology itself. It can shape the social practices, and even shape laws and regulations. So this, these kinds of principles hold for the fish, the eels, and the, uh, the fisher people. But it also holds for us as, as actors, uh, technology organizations. Um, there are no hierarchies in importance in the sense that all actors, whether they are human or non-human, so even like technology is an actor, organizations are actors, they could all be equally important in how they shape and affect the network. Um, in actor network theory, there's also this focus on networks that are dynamic and changing. The relationships between actors aren't fixed, they evolve over time. And this means that the role and influence of an actor can change, and with it, the entire network can transform. So this is kind of emphasizing the agency that different actors have in this network. And then finally, understanding complexity. Um, actor network theory helps us to understand complex situations by looking at all the actors involved and how they interact. Um, so it, <clears throat> it engenders this big picture view of thinking. So it's particularly useful in technology studies because it doesn't just focus on the technology itself, but on the whole network of relationships that give that technology meaning and power. So the link with transhumanism is uh, very strong. So actor network theory engenders these principles that we know from transhumanism. The power and the agency of the actor actors in the network, technological solutions to environmental challenges, Big picture views, a long-term perspective across many generations. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Long Now Foundation, the 10,000 year clock. Promotion of science, rational thinking, and responsibility towards the planet and future generations. Um, so I have taken this um, long route to arrive at our event today 
where we celebrate the 25th anniversary edition of the Transvision Workshop. Um, in this workshop, we have a few aims and goals. So we try to foster community and collaboration. We try to bring everybody together, create a sense of community. Um, and we try to bring together a diverse set of people, because transhumanism and these principles that we saw are very broad and diverse. And by bringing people together, we of course hope to get um, some stimulating discussion and inspire uh, new thinking and innovation. Um, we stimulate debate and discussion. We don't step back for skeptical notes. And maybe this can even influence uh, policy. Um, we had a, a very nice article in the the Daily Graph. Can you turn the mic up? Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we had a very nice article in the Telegraph uh, last Saturday, where um, this is a um, uh, daily national newspaper in the Netherlands, and to do this kind of outreach um, to get people, uh, to make people aware of transhumanism, what it is, to make it familiar, um, is also a very important um, goal of this conference series. So we try to empower the individual. We want to give you the best information to make the best possible choices and to be the, uh, an actor in this network and to make informed decisions. <coughs> Together we explore the future of humanity, so we'd like to do some, um, some, some broad, open-minded thinking and to build legitimacy and recognition for our community. Um, this being the 25th anniversary edition, this, this all started <coughs> about 25 years ago in 1998, in Vesp, a small town not very far from here. And yeah, I was already mentioning to Anders, we had this beautiful device called the overhead projector. Um, I say we, I, was, I wasn't there myself. Um, but um, as Anders already pointed out back then, this is the start of something. <coughs> and since then, we, we did a little dig in the photo album. So Transvision was held almost annually. There was an online version uh, during uh, during the COVID pandemic, and um, it has traveled all around the world, uh, many places in Europe, uh, in South America and North America, and great encounters, a lot of great networking, and this year in Paris, and this year in Utrecht. So um, that, that brings us to the event today. And as we all know, transhumanism is, is a very broad topic that touches upon very many areas from the individual to society, uh, from technology to ecology. And we have only time and space to cover a small fraction of these very interesting topics, but we hope to stimulate discussion uh, also over coffee, also tonight at the dinner about any of these topics and uh, many more that will spontaneously come up. <laughs>